What's up, everybody? It's Brooks here. And I'm Dane. How's it going? This is The Root Podcast, where we tell myths, legends, stories, world championships, stories, uh, political activist stories. Oh, shit. (laughs) So that you can... uh, But not at a third grade level. Yeah, not at a third grade level. So you can uh, relate ancient wisdom to your daily life and training. There you go. You've been training? You been training in uh, in any Muslim countries lately? <laughs> I was trying to train a little bit, but the downfall was what I was eating, Papa John's. <laughs> you eating Papa John's and dude, nine days of Qatar. <laughs> yeah, nine days of very very average at best food. What was the best meal you had when you were there? Uh, we went to a Lebanese street. Uh, Lebanese street vendor and it was like the best lamb I've ever had the best hummus I've ever had like phenomenal meal like really 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 good um, but like at a world championships you you get put into the hotel the hotel that they give you there's there's a meal every you, know, you get your free meal every day yeah breakfast lunch and dinner you get three of them and it's the same thing over and over again. And their eggs were gray, dude, like like gray and brown. Yeah. Um, and I ended up eating like bananas and eggs every meal, and it was just and rice, and it was, it was just, it was horrible. <laughs> the food was terrible. And like, dude, I don't complain about food ever. Yeah. But it was it was really really bad. And so by the end of the trip, and you can't drink like. Alcohol's illegal, so to get booze. That's booth, crazy to me. That's dude, crazy to me that in a place like Vegas, alcohol is illegal. You have to get go to a five star hotel and spend fifteen to twenty bucks for one beer. Yeah. That's so like, funny. we drank one night. We and, should save this for the World Championships. Yeah, that's uh, true. Podcast. That's true. I'll stop. <laughs> Today's Indigenous Peoples Day. Oh, okay, though. that's right. Today is Indigenous Peoples Day. Uh, used to be Columbus Day. Um, actually, my kids. This is the first time uh, last year this did not happen, but yesterday Kai said to me that his science teacher or social studies teacher told him that it's Indigenous Peoples Day today. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. That's good. So instead of celebrating, you know, a dude who um, got his math wrong and uh, was xenophobic and racist. I never understood (laughs) why we we felt so indebted to this dude. Like, why do we feel like we owed it to Christopher Columbus? Especially when we're not Spanish or Italian, which is what he is. Yeah. You know, like... This is a freaking Italian dude who was like kind of like the mercenary version of a sailor. Yeah. Just trying to find the funding. shitty version of the really good sailors yeah, that, right. that actually did things. <laughs> found a bunch of dudes, found a bunch of like super redneck dudes who are willing to get on a boat with them. They're probably all like crackheads. Like, <laughs> the crackheads of the, the. Think about the type of roofers that century. you see. Like people who are roofers sometimes are like, yo, that guy's a roofer. If crack were available, it would have been. It would have been on the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. Yeah, yeah. So, so we celebrate, and and that's the thing. So, so they, the the Spanish get here. They, he's actually Italian. So Cristobal Colon, that was his real name, Colon. That's going to be the subject line for tomorrow, Colon, because it's closer to douche. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Cristobal Colon um, comes here, and really for the whole 16th century, it's Spanish, Spanish yeah. and Portuguese. Mm-hmm. They're everywhere. So the fact that we feel as a mostly like English nation after that, the fact that we feel super indebted to Christopher Columbus for doing that. Yeah, but people don't piece that together. They don't sit there and go, what happened from 1492 until like 1680? Yeah, right. 1660. Like they don't think that way. They don't think like, what? Jamestown was what, 1620 or something like that? Yeah, so it's like, what? The first. Right. Like 120 years. I just, I don't comprehend why as a country, and, and like when you bring this stuff up it's like oh how dare you you're talking so you're anti-american it's like no dude like it's actually anti-american to like this guy like we should have we should as a country as an english-speaking country even like recognize the people we stole the country from the indigenous people and then probably the next step would be like recognize what most of the English the majority early, uh, the early founders actually did who, who made the big decisions to make the country what it is right yeah which could be where the iroquois yeah, right, discussion. exactly. So that was one thing we wanted to touch on is is uh, is get to um, a bit of – yeah, I guess we should go chronologically here then. So, <laughs> so if we, before before we get to the subject of uh, today's discussion, Jay Dude, Guevara – People are really so pissed that you have that shirt. So we're talking about the founding of the Americas. We need to talk about Che Guevara. Um, 
But before we talk about that, the well, and the other, so so the Spanish, the Spanish colonize and and enslave pretty much the hemisphere for a good, at least the coastal portions of the hemisphere for a good 150 years before the English are able to essentially become better than them at sailing. Mm -hmm. That's what happens Mm -hmm. is it's so it's worth so much to come over here and steal shit from the natives that they don't care if they sink whole ships. The Spanish Armada is is literally dropping ships down in the ocean like, ah, oh, whatever, leave that yeah, one behind, keep we'll going, keep going. And that's what makes them rich for years and years. And same with the Portuguese, right? These little tiny nations that just figured it out first, established the roots, established the... They figured out YouTube way before everybody else. Exactly. And they stuck to it. <laughs> yeah, they <laughs> stuck to it. And then the English just show up and go, all right, you know what? We, we realize we've been missing the boat here for... 100 years we're gonna get on youtube we're gonna get a good channel going <laughs> and take over the rest of the world yeah that's how shit works <laughs> as long as you can stick with it <laughs> as long as you can stick with it yeah which the english are pretty well known for <clears throat> so all right so if we're going up through uh talking about indigenous peoples let's talk about the influence of the the five nations which became later the seven nations on our form of government before we get into che Guevara. All right, so if we if we talk about the Iroquois or Iroquois or Iroquois, I don't, I don't know the proper the Haudenosaunee. Yeah, so they, yeah, that it that confederacy was basically broken into five states, and the five states, um, it was like Seneca, Oneida, Cayuga, uh, Mohawk, and. There was one other one that I don't remember, yeah. um, and so their their whole if if you actually think about the way that they that they built everything the way they lived even was they and I'm going to use my cell phone for an example is like they they would live in what they called a long house like this and yeah. so there was fires up the middle and and you know each house might have. Uh, eight to ten families and they were a, a matriarchal. Uh, society basically the the women set up like the power figures with everything and so the the families would would be on the outside and these giant they almost look like pole buildings um and that's a a big key on how they actually set up their their government in general is that they they sat there and they said okay we've we've got each house has has their 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 leaders and their rulers and they would they would always discuss and debate on how to uh, resolve any issues, politically any issues, society, from a societal uh, perspective. And then one thing I wanted to point out is that I'd, I'd, do, I'd done some research. I think a guy's name was DeWitt Clinton, or uh, he spoke at the like the New York State Assembly in like the eight, eight, eighteen ten. I think it was Clinton was his last name, but I'm not positive. He was he lived with them for a while. He like he really liked their government setup, but he's yeah. he compared it to the Romans. He he was also an idiot. Um, but he had done research and said that he had never heard any story of of a chief like disobeying what the matriarch had initially wanted them to be set up for. Like they would always fall in line with the way that the the government was actually established that's they would what, never go yeah the, the book that i was reading it it was literally called the haudenosaunee and that's what i didn't realize that's actually the other word for the iroquois and both of those iroquois and haudenosaunee both mean people of the long house yeah people of, yeah yeah, yeah that's, um, that's right i forgot to point that part out <laughs> and the other one is the onondaga yeah onondaga, onondaga is the is smallest the, one i believe yeah and so the the way it was set up is they would choose like a war chief, a peace chief. Um, there was a third one, and then they had something called a sachem. And the harmony s- chief, war, peace, and harmony. Okay, you should shut up. <laughs> <laughs> You're such a fucker. <laughs> but the so the war the war chief was obviously like in charge of attacking people and protecting, and then the peace chief would be for maintaining peace and and any diplomacy that they might need. And the sachem 
was the the representatives that they sent from each area. So each state had a group of representatives, and the the biggest one, Seneca. Um, was the second biggest. The Mohawk were the biggest, and they were on. Seneca was on the northern part of the Confederacy. The Mohawks were on the southern and south western part of the Confederacy, and then the three were in the middle. Which and all the, this is in is in like uh, New western New York, like central New York, mm-hmm. and down into Pennsylvania a little bit. Yeah, but not that much. And and so they had they had um, control, and those were the two biggest states. But then the and if you can actually think the way they set everything up was set up like this long house. It was like okay between that, rivers. Yeah, yes, between rivers, pretty much. And that yeah. that was those were the two biggest states. Um, and then they would send these sachems to these big meetings, and they'd have the meeting directly in the middle. And I b- believe it was in a, the Oneida state. They would have these giant meetings of the Confederacy, and they would have um, everybody would set up in a long house, and they would discuss these things on what the Confederacy was going to do. And I think like the Mohawk had fourteen representatives, and the Seneca had nine or ten, and then the other three had between seven and nine, and it added up to uh, fifty total representatives. And the Mohawk sat on this side of the room, and the and the uh, Seneca sat on this side of the room because they were the most powerful. But the other three um, sat like together. And what ended up happening is because of these were the two power, the powerful ones. The other three sort of balanced those two out. So it was it was a way to like unite all five of those of those groups. And so that's that's like how they ran their that that's like a very short version of how they did their their government but, but it was representative it was, rep- was the idea is that it was representative of democracy and even when even when the tuscarora who were the sixth nation to come in uh-huh. the tuscarora i didn't realize this until last year came from the carolinas yeah and they were literally like looking for um like-minded and yeah they, they were just like we we've heard about you guys obviously they probably traded with them at some point mm-hmm. um but they were almost looking for asylum because they were getting attacked by tribes down there coming yeah. up from the south and probably who are getting encroached on from the Spanish because this is in the 1600s that yeah. they that they approached them 16s or, or maybe even 1700s. Um, the book that I was reading last year was uh, was a, a guy named Henry uh, Henry something Lewis Henry Lewis Henry Morgan or something like that. Um, and he lived with them and he knew, he learned the language and stuff like that. Grew up with them. Um, and he talks about them coming up and they. They essentially ask for asylum, and the five nations agree to accept them into the league, and then they give them the southernmost portion of it, which is into Pennsylvania, and that's yeah. why Tuscarora Mountains are yeah, yeah, in the central yeah. part of Pennsylvania. That makes sense. And so they got like the Susquehanna River coming down from where it starts up in just south of the border right. of, from New York. They got the Susquehanna down towards almost north of Harrisburg. That makes sense, actually. Yeah. But the, the interesting part is that the relationship between – the 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 white people and the Nate and the Iroquois was they were always like, can we talk to your chief? And they didn't comprehend one that like really the people who were making the decisions to rule were the women. They couldn't comprehend that. And then they couldn't comprehend that those chiefs were really not powerful. They were just representatives. Like yeah. there was guys that were leaders of, of the military, but they were not viewed as more important than the guy who was the diplomacy guy who was trying to keep peace or, or viewed as lesser than, than the sachem. They were all viewed very equally. And then they, at the end of the day to decide anything, they'd have to go to the ultimate long house, right. And like make this representative decision of, there's 50 people here and we're all representing the five the five states and we need to come to a conclusion and if they would go they would go through these debates and they would they would they would continue to go in these circles of debating and if they didn't come to a resolution then they wouldn't they wouldn't decide they'd, they'd leave and come back later on or they would have one of the three states in the middle basically be the deciding factor like okay do we go against this? Because ultimately, it came down to like Seneca and Mohawk had most of the power, had perceived most of the power, but it would be like how to how to manage that so that everybody had an equal an equal amount of of power in the Confederacy in general. So it's it's pretty interesting. And they stayed pretty autonomous. Like they were they were. Um, I mean, it's 
there was a, a few times like the French and Indian Wars. The whole point of that was that they were they were essentially recruited by the French. Yeah, you know, to to oppose the English, and it it like went back and forth. But they would always go one side or the other as a group. They yeah. wouldn't they yeah. wouldn't be like it wouldn't be like the Mohawks went this way, and Seneca, know, Seneca went, went that way. Yeah. Way they whatever. were always choosing everything. Yeah, and they would I. The, the, like a sovereign state's view today, basically. Yeah, exactly. And that that Lewis Henry Morgan book that he he talks about, they would sometimes they they'd press as far east as like northern New England mm-hmm. to just get you know if if that's where wildlife was, they'd go there to get stuff, dry it, bring it back home, and they go as far west as like um, like they were going into the Ohio River Valley. I was just, I actually think there was they might have even gone towards like Michigan. I think they got pushed out there. Yeah. Once once everything they became like a marsh people. Yeah. After a while, they went out. They went up to like Minnesota, Michigan, and they became like marsh people. Yeah. Once, once, uh, once whites pushed them far enough out. Right. But I think they cohabited for for a lot of the for, 18th century. Right. right. Most of the 1700s. Yeah. Yeah, and then the 19th century basically is when they started getting really pushed out. Right. And there's still reservations up that way though. Up in. Uh, New I was gonna York. say there's there's still a lot of. I mean, <coughs> especially the Seneca the Seneca like tribe is is. The, I, the Iroquois nation is one of the more powerful nations. Yeah. The problem is, is like you still, I don't know if they're related to like the Mohegan Sun stuff, but it, it's still like not the way that they're, the fact that everything is still based around gambling and, and, yeah, right. and alcohol and stuff like that. It's just such a shitty situation where it's like, yeah, I, I, I remember hitchhiking through Ontario and seeing, you know, Canadian flags upside down and American flags upside down because you're going through these reservations the and you res. have no idea. Like, oh my, what? You're not what? paying any fuel to any road taxes for fuel or anything. Right, right. And you're like, what? What is going on? Why? What's the problem with these people? But yeah. I, I didn't know anything. Yeah. I didn't know what their their history was. I didn't know, you know, because the history I knew was entirely our history, our right. version of it. Like we were trying to, to you know make them civilized or whatever, not knowing that, like... The Carlisle School. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> not knowing, like, wow, we basically stole their entire their entire ruling system. I mean, for good reason, because it was effective, and it yeah, was... It worked. It worked, you know, yeah. and it's like... I don't well, know. and everybody, everybody wants to have... I mean, not everybody. I think democracy's trialed, you know, been trialed... Uh, <laughs> hundreds of times if not thousands of times probably in history and it's hard Mm -hmm. and so people tend to go tend tend to lean back towards dictatorships and monarchies and things like that because it's like all right whatever just let just let this happen again because we suck at doing it this way but this was like a centuries long thing that worked for uh you know managing resources yep. managing people you know in in a very specific geographic area managing conflict managing conflict yeah cr- you know deciding to go into conflict as a group as a group of um probably not very like you were not allowed to marry you weren't you weren't going to go you know Seneca to Mohawk right. you were going to stay right. within your tribe right and that's how it was so like for for Divert culturally diverse people to to stay together for that long. It's pretty freaking. It's, pretty it's big cool. Deal. Yeah, and I, and I think that's. I don't know. I th- I think that it's it's a part of history. Being a history major, getting a degree in history, and getting a degree in religion. I feel as though to answer people that why do we bring up you know why do we question Christopher Columbus or why do we bring up Indigenous Peoples Day for me as someone who got my degrees in religion and history I feel slighted the fact that I can learn more about these people on Wikipedia and on YouTube and on on the internet in general than anyone ever taught you. Than anyone ever <laughs> taught me in school. And that's yeah. something that, like, growing up, you know, my children growing up, it's like, dude, you're going to know, like, what what the history was proper yeah. and, and why things are the way they are now so that we have a better comprehension of where we're at from a government perspective. Because otherwise it's just going to continue to be a shit show. A people's history of the yeah. United States. Yeah, exactly. So that, that's some recommended reading for today. So that was Howard Zinn. That's probably one of the first ones that I ever read. That had any kind of uh, alternate, you know, story to the main thread that I had been taught growing up, which was, for me, it was literally like, how did we get here? 
as white people and then how did we break ground and expand how did we turn the forest into farms and then how did we turn the farms into cities yeah that yeah. was the story yeah and and then what were the big names and it was always like you were supposed to remember these these famous people mm -hmm. who did a thing yeah. meanwhile never being even shown like this was what life was like in Philadelphia in yeah. 1750 this was a, and this was a structure yeah for a person who was a normal person this yeah. was what life was like if you lived on the frontier in the early 1800s which was like western pennsylvania right this was what life was like there and this is what life was like for somebody who was living here for millennia and then got forced out of there right. you know and what was life like for them before so i think that's kind of the story for indigenous people's day in general is what's the it's the story of like enslavement of the person who you know is on the shit end of the stick and and is trying to make something work and then for us realizing what actually happened? How do we not let that shit happen again? Yeah. You know, and how do we understand what happened so that we can make better decisions in the future? For for me, the I remember I had AP history my senior year, and one of the books, who did you have? Uh, uh, Mr. Rentschler. Oh, I never had him. Yeah, one of the books that we read was Much Ado About History, or Much oh, Ado, yeah. yeah, Much Ado About History from yeah. Kenneth. Let's say his name was Kenneth Adams or something like that. It's upstairs. Is it? You probably is. It's yeah. upstairs. And I just remember it was the first book where i was like wait andrew jackson like disobeyed like the supreme court like he didn't he didn't listen to yeah, right. he didn't like follow the checks and balances and then and then me bringing that up to dad and dad be like who's telling you that <laughs> and then me reading History. it again and, be, and being like <laughs> wait he just said to, like the supreme court made their ruling now let them enforce it like that's actually that's actually history that's actually yeah. what happened we should learn this stuff and that's no, so that's just like yeah. that was my first exposure to like what was real yeah i well i think so and and so you go on I, I, for me anyway i went on i probably i didn't go to school for history so i didn't get to have that you know as as part of my schooling, but while I was learning about, you know, engineering and math and how to use tables of numbers to make airplanes fly, I was like always wanting to read stuff that was exactly the opposite of what I was doing. So yeah. other stuff. And so for me, like the Che Guevara book, reading the, not the motorcycle diaries first, but I first, I read the, his biography, which was huge. And then I read, I read, um, the motorcycle diaries after that to me was exactly like going through the same process of realizing all the stuff I've been fed was was false. Yeah. That that Che Guevara, especially as a young kid, I mean, he was a doctor. He was a medical student, and and then became a doctor. And he went through basically the same thing, riding a motorcycle the length of South America, seeing all of these indigenous people essentially being enslaved by companies, by by usually American companies, um, by but but by European, so so German. Um, some of them were German, some were French, but a lot, uh, there was a couple of American companies too that were mining. So South America, it's a lot of mining and, and that's what it was when the Spanish came. Yeah. They were yeah. literally, people were dying by the dozens by the day to get silver up out of the ground. And the same thing Especially was in still Argentina. Happening. Yeah. And so that's to Isn't me. that where like Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, they were like mining? Bolivia. Yeah. Yeah. And they so went back down to Bolivia. Like... Yeah. Yeah. Which is where he ends up getting killed. Yeah. Che Guevara ends up getting killed. So for me, like reading that stuff, I I read it and and where my mind went right away was this whole like idea that that communism, that socialism was going to be better than capitalism because these guys thought that too, right? Right. And that this is like where we need to go. And I think that's kind of a, I think culturally a lot of young people are going there right now too. Yeah. That idea that like, well, this one's broken. The way this one's going is broken. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the only way to fix it is, is the to do the one. exact opposite. Right, right. Right? And instead of saying, I'd be like, both of these are pretty broken, and there's got to be better ways. Got to be a different way. Yeah, there's got to be a... <laughs> there's a, And the, the, uh, the most frustrating part for me is, like, I remember getting into arguments about uh, Margaret Thatcher saying, like, Tina, there is no alternative, and yeah. Ronald Reagan, and, and saying that, and and then, well, if you don't want to live here, if you don't think this is good, go live somewhere else. It's like, no, dude. Like part of what Thomas Jefferson said was like, 
we should constantly constantly be adapting and like scrapping our system and creating a new system yeah. that evolves. And I think that that's open source. Yeah, and and so like the way that attitude pisses me off so much and it makes me want to hit people so much because it's like, dude, we there, the fact that you want to say that there's no alternative to democracy or there's no alternative to communism or socialism, like. There's there's a, there's always an alternative to get better. There's monarchies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know. I just it's, came from one. There's, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it's like, it's like there's always ways to improve, and to to deny that question is so ridiculous to me. Yeah. It's like, well, and, and there's so, ways to improve our current democracy, like blatant ways that we could improve right totally. now. Yeah, that we're just ignoring because make voting on a cell phone possible. Yeah, and it, but it'll be <laughs> it'll be like hard or something, or yeah. or then we got to monitor and make sure that there's less cheating involved. And but it's gonna happen anyway, so we might as well do yeah. it, right? It's, it's called you figure it out, right? Yeah. And so so I think that the same, I, I I I sympathize more with young people who think that socialism is the answer than I do with somebody who's just going shut your mouth because I'm like always. My set point is always think for yourself, question authority. Yeah, that's yeah. what I always go back to, and that's what I always think, and that's why I loved Che Guevara in the first place. Was you know this is a guy who who literally couldn't stand what was going on in South America. His motorcycle journey took him up through Central America. You know he's he's literally he's gone to school at, for to, to be a doctor. Now he's a physician, um, but instead of going the normal path of his like more Spanish parents, he is traveling through Central America and sees. Uh, was it United Fruit? Yeah, exploiting people there and starts getting pissed off in Costa Rica. Literally, where the term banana republic comes from. Right, right. Literally, where it comes from is companies essentially owning a whole country so that they could exploit the resources there, the labor there, take fruit out of the out of the country and sell it somewhere else. So he sees this stuff. He sees the injustice, and eventually meets the Castro brothers, Raúl and Fidel Castro. And is Raúl still alive? Raúl's still alive. Yeah. Yeah, and and, uh, and and teams up with them, and they're like, "Yeah, we're gonna like Cuba is basically Las Vegas on an island." Yeah, right. They've the the United States essentially owns the government here, Batista. Yeah, oh, yeah Esen- I think so. Essentially owns Batista. Everybody comes down here, you know, like Parties. rapes our women, yeah. gets drunk, does you you know screwed up shit. We don't get anything. None of the money stays here. You know, like a few rich people have it, and that's it. And he's like. Yeah, they're like, well, we want to take the country back, you know, and we want to, we want to, we want it to be run by the people, that sort of thing. And he's like, all right, let's do it. And so they get all set up, and uh, they train in Mexico. And this is why, this is why a lot of Mexicans, like, and Cubans, have this kind of eternal love for each other because the revolution started on Mexico. Right. So they set sail, like they had, uh, they call it a yacht, but it was like probably a boat. It was like thirty-five people who actually, who actually did the the revolution. Who started it? Yeah, and so the Castros and um, and Che Guevara and a whole bunch of other dudes that they recruited and they were training in the Yucatan Peninsula, sail across uh, the Caribbean Sea over to Cuba, make landing. Batista knew they were coming, and so like half of them are killed the first day that they make landfall, and essentially become guerrillas, fight for the next year and a half, two years, and take over the whole freaking country. Dude, that'd be scariest why would people do that <laughs> my first reaction is like yo you guys just, you're crazy <laughs> it's nuts it's literally nuts because you got to figure at some point when half the guys died you just go dude we gotta get out of here this yeah. is messed up we were stupid to think we could do this you yeah. know i'm not sure at what point like the soviets became involved probably not until the tide was starting to turn yeah because that's when a big government would say hey dude, yeah, we these guys hate them. the americans we can do this you right. know we but also in the back of their mind was this idea that's this Socialism was a better concept than capitalism because of the fact that their entire lives they had been screwed in the ass yeah. by capitalism. Mm-hmm. So it makes complete sense. And this is where I, I like got into it with Loomis uh, a couple of months ago. It was like, dude, don't you understand? And you know, he was like, how could a smart guy like that not understand that socialism doesn't work? And I'm like, dude, it's a different time frame. You <laughs> he have didn't to... have YouTube yeah. and Wikipedia you to have tell to, him what you have to like be able to empathize with. <laughs> and and the experiments so in the had late happened. 40s and yeah. early 50s yeah the, and that the the social experiments hadn't really happened yeah. yet like and they didn't know what was going on in the Soviet Union they didn't the gulag was literally like yeah like nobody knew about it yeah, like exactly. that's that's the biggest thing the information and, wasn't out because they wouldn't let it out yeah and that's that's dude i know this sounds weird but like i think the more i travel 
I actually think the more closed minded I get, like, because <laughs> I realize like Russians are that way. Yeah, no, I know. I think it's a it's and a Hungarians thing. are that way, it, and Bulgarians it, are this way, and South Americans are this way, and Americans are like this, except yeah. for. Canadians are that way. They're the best ones. <laughs> the Northern Europeans are like that. And it's like so predictable. Africans, the, the sub-Saharan Africans are like this. The North <laughs> the North Africans are like this. And it's like so predictable. So on Indigenous People's Day, we're reinforcing all the stereotypes. <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> I know what you mean, though. I've, dude, I've seen the same thing where you're just like, well, like oh, the rest yeah, of the, you're like, you're... Even even for me, like Latin America, you're like, oh wait, you're you're not Mexican, you're Colombian. You behave slightly differently yeah. than this guy, yeah. than my friends from Mexico do, and it's like, well, and like too, I sit there, and I'm like, so this is why Canadians can have like very very liberal laws, like like well, in the sense that Canadians are typically it's 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 definitely more socialist as a, of a country, not that it's socialist because it's not, but it is more socialist based. Um, but then they actually have, uh, I'd say law wise, they're more conservative in the sense that like, it's harder to own guns and it's harder. Like, I mean, the drinking age is a lot more liberal, but you can just see why that socialism would work more with Canadians because of their personality and they're not American. Yeah. And it wouldn't work in the U S cause it's not how we're wired. Like we're, we're very different and like Northern Europeans, it will work with northern europeans but like the soviets you can like you meet russian people you're like no oh, that's why it's not gonna work yeah like, is it gonna work in in like italy probably not no because yeah, <laughs> nobody like, can get anywhere on time yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> it's like, there's there's a lot of things where it's just gonna be yeah it's gonna be based on i mean and this is actually that's what che Guevara found out like once once they took over so so there's this big long war and then they have tribunals afterwards and and the big thing that I always loved about Che Guevara was he was he was like uh, uh, Secretary of the Interior, Minister of the Interior, right? So he was like in charge of like agrarian programs. And the idea was that everybody was going to work a set number of hours in the fields, yeah. everybody, physicians, yeah, yeah. whatever. And he was like so, so um, naive about that being a possibility yeah. that he thought that he did it every day. He would work eight hours in the field and then come in for another eight to ten hours of government work with the Castros and got the shits of it when he was just like, dude, why aren't you guys working in the field with me? Yeah. You know, he's overseeing like tribunals that are literally like murdering all the war criminals who right. were just Cuban soldiers who were fighting you against know, them or against them, yeah, against the guerrillas. Really it was like whoever didn't turn, yeah. right? Whoever didn't join the revolution is who ended up getting murdered in the end. Which is what everybody does yeah. when they take over a country, yeah. you know. And so, so he's like the the reason that he became like a spy, and the reason that he got shipped off to the Soviet Union was because the Castros couldn't stand how much of a how much of how narrow, like how focused he was on actually doing real socialism, right? <laughs> Instead of engaging with the power, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so he saw like right away, oh, this is uh, this is the same thing that happens everywhere, and it's a stereotype. Yeah. You get power. And now this is what happens, yeah. right? Yeah. And that is literally exactly what happened. Yeah. And that's exactly what happens in the Soviet Union. Is you've got the you've got the you know the Soviets, you've got the communes, and once people realize like oh, I don't actually have to do work, well I'm not uh, going to do work, right? You know. Fuck. But you don't you don't know that when you're fighting against the forces that yeah. came to essentially take you over and you know screwed your whole life up in the first place. I guess. I don't know. It's one of those things where it'd be interesting if we were more patient and more cerebral, if like we could sit there and say, these cultures are all, you know, and that's the thing. When I say more closed minded, I, I become more in, in tune with the sense that I know how most Russians are. I know how most, you know, Qatari are. I know how most Americans are. I know how, how like, you know, the wired. behaviors they tend towards. Yeah. The social, yeah. So societal norms for that particular group. Yeah. But that's also how you become like a good coach or a good manager or a good boss is well, you, so, you understand certain types of people. Right. And you go, oh, you behave this way when this happens. Right. Now I know how to manage you moving forward, or now I know how to coach you as a person. Moving so forward. what would be interesting is if, if we would be patient enough as a as a group or as a as a society, as a global society, to sit there and be like, 
all right, let's try and figure out what type yeah, of political we'll system. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what type of political system will work best for specific types of cultures? Because that's what that's the other thing is that that's, you know we we spent all this time like. Uh, Why do Russians still have an oligarchy? <laughs> yeah, and killing Salvador Allende, right? But it's like, dude, Chile can't have the same government as the Americans no, because they're different people. Work. They are yeah. different people. They are wired differently. They have different past experiences, and that's the way it is. Yeah, there's no one size fits all, and and it's like it's only going to become harder, you know, as people get more integrated with one another. But that only tends towards more open source solutions for things where you go okay like what's the what's the least common denominator here what can we all agree on and what do we what does nobody want to have happen yeah right yeah. so like we have the freaking technology and the capabilities of doing that right now the only reason yeah. we're not doing it is because we have systems in place that won't allow us to think to think that way yeah you can't run and get elected on on destroying the system that you're running Inside. Right, because you would, you would, you wouldn't be elected, and people would be like, "Oh my God, he's trying yeah. to ruin everything." Yeah, which takes you back to so. Then, when is the what? What happens? Like, you can't. There's, there's no more guerrilla revolutions. I mean, that's not happening. I would say, in my mind, something like, <coughs> like the Iroquois, it, it, going back to what they were running, is is it, it that to me was more like a representative, direct democracy. It was like. Everybody was there was representatives, but there was also like a direct You're personally accountable. Yeah, you were held personally accountable by your tribe, and yeah. that's like the whole thing that I think is where we're gonna end up rolling towards. Is it's gonna get to the point where like we have less and less um, executive leadership, and it's gonna hopefully that becomes less powerful, and over time it becomes more powerful to be a representative, and then in turn. Over time, it shifts to like a direct democracy that's digital. You like know? Mike Nolan says this, and I completely agree with it. He he says that Obama came too early, that we had, we 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 shouldn't have gotten like the nice guy president at the time that we did. Like we needed somebody to screw things up for us. Yeah. <laughs> like like Trump yeah. Trump should have should have been here earlier, earlier to make things like basically like anarchy, so you yeah. can come up with new solutions and like. I mean that's what, that's why I haven't thought for a long time that this guy was ever going to get impeached because I'm just like no 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 like we need this we yeah. like literally need this guy yeah. to destroy shit he needs to get reelected he will get reelected he will how much would a bet hundred bucks that he that he I actually think he will <laughs> I do think he will <laughs> on Indigenous Peoples Day or shit <laughs> yeah, you, you can't win that bet no. <laughs> you lose either way. If you lose, you he lose. If you win, next year, yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. Fuck. No, it's next year, twenty twenty. Well, look at the look at the Democrats, man. How do you run? How do you run a camp? Here's the here's the thing, too. All right, the thing that really pisses me off about this whole idea that the Democrats have of not meddling in elections, dude. We meddle in every election, yeah. and it's a well known fact that in the '60s, JFK was essentially put was essentially helped yeah, into yeah, place yeah. by a Russian. Yeah. But no, they but, wanted him because he was young and they thought he was going to be a pushover. But people love ignore dude, people love ignoring the fact that that the Democrats purposely ruined Bernie Sanders' opportunity to I know, win. Like right. like they well, actually Well, there's a certain se a f section or a, a factor of them that doesn't will never forget that. But it's like, dude, you guys do like they, you bring that up and it's like like, that's the thing. Somebody's going to watch this and be like, oh, you guys love, like, Democrats. It's like, no, there's, like, big problems all across the board. And it, when the Democrats recognize this and when Republicans recognize this, then there might actually be some yeah, semblance right. of positive change. No, so, like, Khrushchev, Khrushchev wanted Kennedy, well-known fact, because he thought he was going to be a young dude and he was a pushover and whatever. So Khrushchev wanted him there. And that's, like, to me, if you're a foreign government, if you're any global power and you don't meddle in elections to try and get the person that you have, that you want to work with the most or you want to manipulate the most, you're not doing your job. Right. You should be doing that. So yeah. so fine. Throw that out the window. Stop complaining about that and, and be okay with it. It's focus on the way this dude does it. Yeah. Focus on the behaviors that he takes. Like, like you know, calling calling uh, a country to get dirt on somebody while doing all these other sleazeball and things. And then tweeting about it. Yeah, like, like, focus on that, man. It's not just the idea. Dude, George W. Bush, Bush would have never done that shit. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's the craziest thing. The stuff that he does. But yeah, I think, 
Anyway, I think how do you how do you win an election with twenty candidates? Yeah. How do you how do you even coming into now? What are they going to have six or eight or something like that? Yeah. At the Bates now, it's too many, man. It's too many ideas. You're fighting with each other. Like, well, the only thing is, though, English the English though they go through like rounds. It's sort of like a tournament where it's like, like eight people go here and then the next round is like six people here and then the next round is like four and they love soccer tournaments probably (laughs) of course they're dealing with the same shit though dude their guys it's like idiots yeah trump jr it's like similar they almost i follow like the the identical pattern of the u.s yeah it's crazy like like tony blair was like george w bush yeah you know and, and i i can't even remember this dude's name but he's like he literally looks like Trump, and he speaks no, like him. Yeah, I forget um, his first. I forget his. Dude, we're terrible. How do we not know the freaking <laughs> prime minister's name? Uh, Boris. Yeah. No, no. Is he the mayor? Is he the London's mayor? Coon, you know. Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson. He's the prime minister yeah. now. We look so stupid. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it for the room. <laughs> it's okay. I, I know the capital of Canada is Ottawa. Most people don't know that. <laughs> All right, we should probably wrap it up anyway. So anyway, on Indigenous People's Day, the thing to Boris Johnson is a prime minister. Oh, thank God. We look less <laughs> dumb now. He just uh, looks like a dope. <laughs> yeah. I watched a lot of his shit over the last, like, three weeks. We need indigenous, an indigenous government. That's what we need. We need the Iroquois government fully implemented. Yeah, well, there you go. That's our that's our Indigenous People's Day recommendation for 2019. Um, <laughs> implement the Five Nations or Six Nations, whichever you prefer, uh, government for the foreseeable future. All right, sounds good. Peace. Thanks for listening later. <laughs>